welcome to this event. We are delighted to have you here and really looking forward to hearing from Michael shortly, Harmony and Health Adopters View. I was speaking to someone this morning who is based in Australia. He'd just been out to do his shopping and he said he thought there was a very strong correlation between the food in our supermarkets and how healthy we are as a community and as a nation and as a people. Uh, and it was an interesting observation. We are what we eat and what we eat reflects often on the health and well-being that we we have in our in ourselves. So just to start the ball rolling and while we wait for a few more people to join us, that simple question, when is anything or any system healthy or well, would be really great to get your engagement with. When is anything or any system healthy or well? So just while we wait for a couple more minutes for people to arrive, I thought it might be helpful to you to explain a little bit more about the Harmony Project and what we do. We are an education charity and we are looking to create a new way of learning, a way of learning that's inspired and guided by principles of harmony, principles of nature, with an understanding that we are nature, we are part of the world in which we live. So we've defined this way of learning through principles that we think young people, indeed anyone, can explore through their learning journeys. And these principles teach us that the world works systemically, it's cyclical, it's diverse, it's constantly adaptive, changing, evolving. And of course, these systems that we see in the world are inherently healthy. They're about wholeness and this lovely link between the word health and whole. So what does it mean to live well, to be healthy, to be whole? And your responses to that through what Michael shares will be really fascinating for us to hear. So before we begin, and I invite Michael to share his presentation, just a, a few housekeeping messages. Please do stay on mute throughout this first part of the presentation. And we are recording this event today. So uh, if you want to look at it again or share it with anyone, it will be available online from next week. So keep sharing those questions and we'll pass them on to Michael later on. Just as a way of introduction, Michael is a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. He was an NHS consultant for over 25 years and now he's medical director to the Poundbury Clinic that's in Dorset and it provides an integrated harmonic approach to healthcare. He's treasurer and council member of the College of Medicine and he's one of the few sports gynecologists in the country. He's attended three Olympics already. So Michael, who is, I might add, a, uh, a school friend, someone who went to the same school as me by coincidence. Uh, Michael, it's great to have you with us. We're really looking forward to your focus on health and this really important message you're gonna share around intergenerational health. So I'm now going to hand over to you and we look forward to having some great conversation a little bit later. Over to you, Michael. So thank you very much, Richard. Now, can, can people hear me now? That's yes. it, great. And I, so what I'll do is I'll share my screen and that's it there. So you can see that screen. So welcome everybody and, and I hope during this rather different time in our lives, you're all looking after yourselves. And, 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 and um, what I want to do is, is I want to convince you, I want to enthuse you that, and open a conversation about the role of harmony in health, because I think it is such an important area, as Richard said, and, 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 and it's evolving. And what I say today may be different next week, may be different in a few months time, in a year's time. So, First of all, I'd like to really thank Richard and uh, Bonnie for all the hard work of the Harmony Project, which I think they are doing inspirational work. And also uh, thank Simon Sudinsky from the Prince's Foundation 
because it was through that and a, a conference that held at which and I were at in, in, in Scotland about the role of harmony education that it really realized to me that this is the way forward. And I, I'm convinced that we need to bring more and more harmony into healthcare uh, for the benefit of all. And Richard's already given you some idea about my sort of provenance. Why am I interested in, and why am I here talking to you is yes, I think going back in my history, my parents and grandparents always had an interest in a harmonic approach to life. And as I said, I, I was a gynecologist and then also moved outside the box and looked in when I worked in the Olympic teams, how to help athletes win gold medal. It is a team approach, it's a harmonic approach that's addressed there. And then also looking at other, other uh, uh, concepts of, of healthcare, traveled a lot to India and China, looked at the role of traditional Chinese medicine, yoga, and, and seen how uh, their wonderful, some of their wonderful practices can be integrated into our practice. And he also, Richard also mentioned the uh, College of Medicine and which wants to reconnect patients and practitioners with the environment. And if you're not already, can I strongly encourage you to, to, to join. But I think the most important thing is, is through my 40 years as a doctor and, and, and life, I realized patients want it and it works and it's needed. That's the most important thing. So, I mean, thinking about my I talk is, is, is really what I'm about to talk for about 25, 30 minutes, you know, is, is, is could be a, a, a three, four, five day seminar, could be a three, four, five year degree course. So I'm just giving you food for thought. I just want to put it out there. I'm not covering it anyway, the whole subject, but I, I just want to make you, as I say, enthused that this is the way forward and, and open up this conversation. And, and as uh, Michael Faraday said, I was looking at how he, he wanted to write a lovely little book on, on how to give a lecture. He said that the, that the generality of mankind cannot accompany us one short hour unless the path is strewed with flowers, and strewed with flowers. I'm not sure I'm gonna give you many flowers, but I thought you'd like to see this, this flower here, which is the, uh, the tulip, but it's called harmony. Uh, and, 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 and I've got, you can see up there, I've got some harmony tulips growing. So next time we speak, I perhaps can show you what a, a harmony tulip looks like grown by Michael Dooley. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to people what harmony and health means. And everybody has slightly different ideas about it. And again, I think this is evolving. This will be cyclical. We'll keep on changing our views. So this is just a start. What does harmony and health mean? And, and the best one uh, concept I got from Roy, the late Roy Porter in his great book, The Greatest Benefit to Mankind. And he says that health depends on the preservation of harmony within the body and harmony between the body, the environment and the larger order of things. Healing is a question of knowing how harmony can be restored and the task of a health professional is as much philosophical as technical. So health depends on the preservation of harmony within the body. And that's what I think is a really good starting point for what the definition of harmony in health is. And then we go back and look at history that William Mayo of the Mayo Clinic in 1870 said, the aim of medicine is to prevent disease and prolong life. The ideal of medicine is to eliminate the need of a physician. Note he uses the term physician. I suppose when you break a leg, you won't be able to heal it. But, but, but I think what the most important point here is the first law of medicine is to start with prevention. And that's why I challenge everyone to say, is the teacher of today the doctor of or for tomorrow? Because what is taught in the schools will affect that individual, yes about health, but also help improve the whole of the community. They are passed on to their mothers and siblings and fathers and their grandmothers, but also they're passed on to their children. So it is intergenerational in that respect that teaching in schools can teach about good health and, and, and healthy and environment, et cetera. And it's passed on both sort of vertically and horizontally. 
So I, I've broken this talk into sort of three sections. One, a bit about the history. Two, then talking about the cycles of life. And then a brief bit about harmony in practice. So we start off with history and, and what we're talking about isn't new. We're going back to 460 BC in Hippocrates. And he stressed that disease was caused by the mental and physical state of the body and by environmental conditions. And thus the purpose of medicine was to help the physis or natural healing power to cure disease, the natural healing power. And also in the Hippocratic Oath, which we all took, he said, do no harm. But also you can see in the slide here, one from one of the uh, army regiments, it's do no harm, but do no harm. Because what we've always got to remember as well in health, anything, anything that can do good can also do harm. And I think that's what we've always got to be careful of, not only the benefits of something, the harm it can do. And I always say that about flowers. You know, flowers need water, but what kills more flowers than anything else is too much water. So it's this balance and everything that does good can do harm. We've got to be aware of it. When we move on to history and the, the cycles of history, I think these are two fantastic photographs. Here is on the right hand side, the first photograph, one of the early photographs of one of the first injections of penicillin to Maureen who sadly died of bacterial endocarditis. And here is the first injection of the COVID vaccine. And then when he's talking about the sort of the cyclical part of the, the spiral of history. This picture was blown up life size in 1945, went around in a train, the penicillin exhibition train, to raise fund for St. Mary's Hospital in London, to make people aware of the benefits of penicillin. And 70 odd years later, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge went around in a train to talk to the workers in the, the dreadful pandemic of COVID. So the history of the journey of the train in 45, the journey in the train 2020, the injections that caused, well, this injection here is going to save so many lives, and this injection here has saved so many lives as well. And what's inspirational to me about this photograph is the man who inspired me, my father, is the man giving the injection. But again, going back to Hippocrates, first of all, do no harm. We do know that now the problem with antibiotics is the overuse of antibiotics. And this is causing the resistance that it's causing. And that's why I've got to look at the natural healing of the body and prevent the danger of the overuse of antibiotics. So if we move then on, is what is our role? And we need to create and encourage healthy, happy, equal, safe future generations to live in a healthy, happy, safe, sustainable environment. One of these is not enough. There's no point in having a sustainable environment if we don't have healthy, happy, equal, safe future generations and vice versa. So the story starts that this little embryo here, which hasn't yet been born, is going to be my new grandchild. And this grandchild has been affected, or will be affected by what I have done to the father, by his sister. But here I think is a lovely photograph of five generations of my family. And here my Aunt Molly and my Uncle Michael and my Pat, all working together because not only it's about health, but it's the, the, the social wisdom that my Aunt Molly would give me, the social wisdoms about health and, and life, etc., and the importance of the intergenerational concept of health. So if we think about cycles then, and moving on about the cycles of life, and I want to tell you the story and the cycles of conception, because it's rather fun. And it's an important lesson to, that we can gain from it. So here we have our pumpkin seed. And the pumpkin seed, when planted into soil, needs a healthy, sustainable soil that's going to feed it and allow it to grow. No different to the sperm that is being produced. In order to produce the sperm to have the healthy child, we need a healthy lifestyle. We need good diet and fitness and vegetables and fruits, etc. And I always think it's lovely that this, the head of the sperm, which contains the genetic material, is very similar to the pumpkin seed. So 
both the sperm and the pumpkin seed need a healthy environment in order for them to be produced. And the sperm is produced in a cyclical way. But then we move on. What is the egg? How is the egg produced? We have the menstrual cycle, the cyclicity, the proliferative phase, and then mid-cycle, an egg is produced. And then um, here's the environment for developing embryo to develop. And this is generally a 28 to 30 day cycle, no different to the moon, 29, just over 29 day cycle. So the cyclicity in the moon and cyclicity in the menstrual cycle and cyclicity in the sperm production as well. So then if we move on and we look about the beautiful geometry that can occur. So when the sperm wants to move up to, to meet the egg, it has to move through the cervix. And the cervix has cervical mucus here, which changes across the menstrual cycle. And here I've dried the cervical mucus at different stages in the menstrual cycle. And you can see beautiful patterns, well, not so beautiful in the early phase, but mid cycle, when fertilization wants to take place, we have this beautiful ferning, like the fern in the woods happen, happening. And here allows the sperm to move on up. So there's changes in the whole body. Um, and other body fluids, I've shown this happens the same in saliva and in nasal mucus and tear secretions. Hormones and the cyclicity of the body is occurring all the time. And then the sperm moves up to meet the egg. Richard pointed out that this is the egg in the, in, in, in the ovary, which is very similar to the shape of the moon. So then what happens? So the sperm meets the egg and a baby is produced. And what I think is amazing is here, another grandchild of mine, little Emily. Emily was just, has just been born, delivered by my daughter, Rebecca. But the egg that made Emily was in Rebecca, but was given to Rebecca when she was in Barbara, my wife's womb. So what Barbara did during her life and during the conception, not the conception, the, the antenatal period of Rebecca could have a huge effect on her grandchild. And I think this is a lovely comment, I'll read it out. All the, sorry, all the eggs a woman will ever carry form in her ovaries while she is a four month old fetus in the womb of her mother. This means our cellular life as an egg begins in the womb of our grandmother. So every one of you listening, the egg that made you was in your grandmother. And each of us spent five months in our grandmother's womb, and she in turn formed within the womb of her grandmother. So we vibrate to the rhythms of our mother's blood before she self, herself is born. Isn't that a lovely story? So then what happens is the egg is then fertilized, and three days later it creates, well, it fertilizes, and then we have a day three embryo and a day five embryo. I always think this picture of a day three embryo is so similar to the black current. But then what happens is it moves on. And again, we are not unique. Here we have the seed needing the healthy soil for the seeds to grow and be healthy. And no different to the human, the embryo comes along and begins to hatch, pop out of itself and then oppose and adhese and invade, but it invades the endometrium. So why should we not be worried about the health of the endometrium that we are worried about the health of the soil? And that's why we've got to think about the, the nutrition and the lifestyle and the environment that could cause a toxic endometrium that could affect the next generation and the generations that go on from then on. And part of harmony, I think, is very much geometry. And if you haven't got it, it's a wonderful book, The Hidden Geometry of Flowers by uh, Keith Critchlow, I think, sadly died. And he showed this beautiful geometry in flowers, using Pythagoras' theorem, etc. is the sunflower. But here's the three-day embryo. Isn't the beautiful geometry in there at this stage, at this early stage, that the human body is so similar to other parts of nature? And it's a wonderful, wonderful picture, I think. So that's a bit about cycles. And let's just move on how I can see that harmony can work in practice. And I'm a great fan of, a mad, uh, of, of, of John Lennon and the Beatles. And I always imagine all the people living life in peace and showing all the world. 
You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And I hope I'm not going to be the only one that dreams that harmony and health is going to be the way forward. And that's why I want you to, to come on this mission and, and help. We all work together to, to, to prove and demonstrate that this is the way forward for uh, uh, health. And so therefore, let's imagine using John Lindson, harmony and health. And how can we use harmony to help health? And again, as I said at the beginning, I could spend, you know, we could spend three, four days working on this and we could all look at different words for H and A, etc. So this is just food for thought, a little bit of, of, of just to, to tempt you to get enthused about harmony. So I'm using the word H and I'm gonna talk about happiness. A, active mind and body. R, reflection. M, being a member of society. O, the oneness. N, nature and nutrition. And Y is you and your team. So I'm just sharing this with you. This is just sort of food for thought, not an extensive encyclopedia of, of, of ideas, but just to, to tempt you. But people often talk about medicine is, you know, what is the evidence for this? And everything I'm talking about has got evidence. But I think what's far more important is not just evidence. What is not, not just the best, sci sorry, the best scientific um, evidence. And evidence-based medicine in practice is what we should be doing. We should be using the best scientific evidence, one's own clinical experience, but also taking into consideration the patient values. It's not one is better than, it's a mixture of everything. And what the patient wants is as important as your clinical experience and, and, and scientific evidence. So we've got to think of it that way, but everything I'm talking about, I'm not gonna present the robust evidence, but it's got evidence behind it. So H, happiness. And again, using John Lennon's stories, um, I'm gonna let you read this because I think it's so lovely. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment. I told them I didn't understand life. And, and then moving on, there's, if you want to learn more about happiness, there's a fantastic book by Richard Leonard, who with Anthony Selden set up the Action for Happiness. Um, and there's lots of the scientific evidence for it. But let's go back to the old Irish proverbs. A good laugh and a long sleep are the two best cures for everything. And Richard and I were just talking earlier that one sad thing about the pandemic is we all storytellers we all like to sit around the fire uh, you know the, 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 the outside in the woods and, and, and talk and dance and sing and a good laugh and a good sleep are the two best cures for anything and I think it is important to remember about sleep and I haven't brought too much about it but sleep is terribly important and it's demonstrated a good amount of sleep um, is so beneficial and decreases the incidence of cardiovascular disease type 2 diabetes, cancer, etc. And some evidence is coming out in the sports world that the benefit of sleep in, 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 in performance. And there's a very good book about, and a very good article recently published about why do we sleep and talks about the benefits of sleep. And the conclusion at the end was, we shouldn't be asking the question, why do we sleep? The question we should be asking is, why are we awake? Waking does the damage, sleeping does the healing. And Again, what we forget is we're all animals. We're not a, 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 a unique breed on this planet. We're all part of a community and it needs to be a sustainable community. And I go back to the animal world, and this is a stud that I went to, because I think we can learn a lot from animal breeding. I asked the stud owner and I said, apart from good nutrition, apart from good nutrition, what's the most important things for your mares to get pregnant. Apart from good nutrition, what's the most important thing for your mares to get pregnant? Instantly, she said, Michael, they've got to be happy, which I think is fascinating. And you can see that in animal breeding and you speak to farmers and other areas, there's distressed animals. And I spoke to a, 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 um, a chicken farmer recently and it's the stress around the chickens don't, don't uh, produce as many eggs. So we've got to learn um, from other species about health. So then we move on, so that's happiness. 
let's talk about active mind and body. And again, um, um, uh, there's lots of evidence about the role of requiring an active mind. And if you haven't, please do listen. You can go, look back on, 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 on YouTube or something. The New Year concert from Vienna, uh, which on Christmas Day on BBC Two um, this year, it was inspirational. It was all, uh, there was no audience, no clapping and, and parts of that, but Ricardo Muti. And if you want to hear any good talk about harmony and health, do listen to his speech, two minute speech. Um, at, at, during the concert, and he said, music is food for healthy brain. And yes, we can talk about so many other things, but there it is, music. And, 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 and that's why going back and singing in, 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 in communities can be such um, a, a benefit for the healthy brain. And we're seeing this in, in virtual, um, 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 con uh, virtual um, choirs on, on, on YouTube, although the, the sound is never quite as good. And then we walk about so active mind and active body and, 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 and we don't have any, people make it complicated. You don't have to spend time going to the gym. You don't have to spend time, you know, getting all your weights out, etc. We've got the green gym, we've got the blue gym. And, you know, we talk about the benefits of walking and not only the benefits of walking, uh, cardiovascular, delays aging, helps uh, boost immunity, etc. But also you have the smells, you can see the nature and you can, get the, 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 the smells from the forest. And, and, and there's so much evidence, not only about the physical, but mental benefits of, of, of walking. And then moving on, other areas, cold swimming is coming a very popular. I'm trying to do it a bit. And, 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 and we, again, we, here's the cyclicity because there's lots of, or beginning to be more evidence about just being walking by water and walking by waves, which are part of the, 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 the lunar cycle, et cetera, and the high tide and low tides, we're all part of the cyclicity of life. But just by walking by waves and, and listening to the, the beautiful sounds of water can make a huge benefit to your health. But also swimming can be good for you, but if you do go and take it gently, if you're not used to it. But Harry Baker gave a lovely little poem recently on Radio 4, I never regretted going for a swim, even on the days I've almost talked myself out of it, when the warm duvet clings to me like seaweed. I love that, when the warm duvet clings to me like seaweed, when on the way whispers, it's never too late to turn back, but it keeps going. So there are, we can keep it simple, it doesn't have to be expensive. And we've all seen these dreadful inequalities that occurred during COVID. And we've got to look at these simple things. Then we move on, we've done happiness, active mind and body and reflection. We could be talking about resilience and other things, but I've just picked up reflection. And I think it's so important during this time, there's been some dreadful events during COVID, dreadful inequalities that have been demonstrated, both social inequalities, digital inequalities, etc. But also I think for some of us, there's been some good things that happen. I've seen it in my patients who are becoming less stressed, they're much more relaxed. They haven't got all that traveling to work. Just for my patients alone, I've reduced traveling by 100 hours, 100 hours per week. Um, and in the rush to return to normal, consider which parts are worth rushing back to. And I think that's very important. But sadly, I think you know, I have this awful suspicion that you know, we all don't know. Those who've had a hangover in the past, you always say, oh, I'm never going to drink again, but you quickly forget. But we mustn't forget. We can, must learn some of the, the good things that have come out, although there have been those dreadful, dreadful uh, problems that have occurred. But again, Gandhi talked about the day of silence. Silence rests the muddled, fuddled, the, the fuddled mind. And I now tell my patients to give me three minutes a day. One minute silence, three times a day, one minute in the morning, lunchtime, the evening, outside if ideal, listening to the birds, listening to them singing. And that can be so good. And we've got evidence to show that can decrease the, the, the stress factor, improve your immune system, etc. So let's use the power of silence um, and, and go for a walk and walk in silence. Being a member of society is so important. And again, I think we've seen this during the the pandemic and it has such a beneficial effect and again we see this in animals that zebras and wildebeests work together to graze the grasslands and I believe cattle grazed with donkeys gain more weight I think there's problems with worms but and what I believe happens is the donkey would eat part of the mud pasture 
that the, the cattle won't eat and it allows growth of the other pasture and they work together. So there is a community role in animals and we need the community, which is so important for our life. And perhaps we've seen it happening here, you know, this hoping, helping the communities, people, those vulnerable people. And this is so important and feeling part of a community is so important for health. And we know this old African proverb, it takes a village to, to raise a child. So we do need the whole village and the community. And as that was intergenerational, I need my great, great aunt Molly talking to me about her life and giving me her wisdoms and my uncle, my great uncle Michael. So it's the intergenerational, which is so important in health and, and well-being. And this is about, uh, you know, the random meetings when you go out and you meet people are dancing lessons from God. I think it's a wonderful old Irish proverb. Random meetings are the dancing lesson from God. When you go out and you go to a party or a social event or just uh, and, and meet uh, people that you didn't expect to meet. But then there's the opposite side. And again, going back to the Beatles, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name. Nobody came. Loneliness is dreadful. And I think you know, what is used for torture is what really affects health. Isolation, uh, sleep deprivation, poor food, nutritional, um, um, uh, abnormal sound. But loneliness is dreadful. And it's associated with depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, sleep problems and sleep problems in its own right can increase the risk of diabetes, heart disease, etc., and increase stress. So it's, it's, it's part of the community and not to allow loneliness. I'm going to talk about O at the end, but then we move on to, to, to nature and nutrition. And I think this is one of the most important parts of the talk is that we talk about the environment, but the most important environment that we've ever been in and will never be in again is the environment of our mother's womb. And life in the womb is now beginning to be demonstrated to cause long-term disease. We know that abnormal environment in the womb increases the risk of cancer, heart disease, depression, and it's becoming much more of a science. And again, when you go back, there's some fantastic work, which a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Richard Lee up in Nottingham is doing about feeding um, 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 uh, pregnant ewes. And he's, we do know that in the male population, there is a decrease in sperm count, a significant decrease in the last 50 years. And why may that be? And is sperm, male sperm, human sperm, the canary of the past, the canary is there to see the toxins in the mine, is the sperm seeing the toxins in the environment. And Richard's shown by feeding uh, pregnant ewes on a certain type of soil, that the fertility of, the, of the, the lambs that come out, the lambs, male lambs that come out, is significantly deteriorated by poor nutrition of the soil. So again, it's this intergenerational that what is affecting, well, what the mother is eating during the pregnancy could affect the long-term health of any baby that is born. And this has been demonstrated by um, Amit Sen, and he said, poor prenatal experience shows the seeds of ailments that afflict adults, and it makes the womb a promising target for prevention. And that's why you know, teachers and educationists can talk about health, what, what the child eats can begin to affect their health, but also affect the next generations because later on they'll become parents and it could affect the production of the sperm, as I showed at the beginning, the production of the egg, and also in the environment of the womb. Again, the cyclicity of all these problems that can occur. Then finally, we move on to the environment, nature, and biophilia is this genetically determined affinity of human beings with the natural world. And again, now I talked about Hippocrates at the beginning. We're now here, we're going back to 1839, and, and Robert Powell demonstrated the healing power of nature. And, and he demonstrated that illness could be cured without the aid of medicine, but paying attention. And this is where we've got to talk to architects, to good food, but also physical activity and the environment in which we live in. 
And this can be demonstrated clearly in hospitals because hospitals, modern day hospitals need to be addressing this and, and, and working because the architect can affect the care of the patient that I operate on. Because if the patient has a nice view and can see nature, she'll stay less time in hospital she'll lose less pain medication and there's an overall patient well-being. So we've got to look at the role of natural light, large windows and natural color. And so we're seeing it and, 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 and you know, if one, I didn't want to bring it up, but you know, if one's talking about the cost of the health service, this, if they're using less medication, they're coming out of hospital quicker, it can make a big difference. And there's lots of evidence for this in intensive care and well-being in intensive care. So much so that some places even have big video screens and have beautiful pictures on the video screens and videos showing the natural world to help um, uh, well-being. And this is biophilia. And this is now beginning to be used for social prescribing, which allows, allows health professionals to, to use a range of non-clinical services to improve healthcare in a holistic way and encouraging using key workers uh, uh, to to point the people into walking groups or gardening groups or bridge groups or knitting groups, et cetera, which is not just the, the, the doing of the walking, but it's the social interaction. There's more and more evidence for this. And finally, we have you and your team. And I, I think it's very important. We, you know, knowledge is power, yes, but knowledge isn't power. It's only power if you begin to use it. And, 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 and we are not in isolation, we're part of a team. And you know, going back to my Olympic work, you know, for somebody to win a gold medal, it's not, it is that individual, but she has a, he has a team around them. Tiger Woods knows how to play golf, but and I've won, followed Tiger Woods around, he has a team around him advising him. Andy Murray knows how to play tennis, but he has a team around him to help support him. And that's why, you know, why Weight Watchers is so beneficial it's because you have that team spirit in order to help people encourage good health. You know, um, um, Lewis Hamilton has what 1,500 people around him to create the team and together everyone achieves more. But I do love, you know, and we have seen this now during the pandemic, that you know, a team is like a tea bag. You don't know how good it is until you put it in hot water. And I think we've seen some wonderful teams who have been put in really hot water come out of the pandemic. So being part of a team. So therefore we have the harmony, the, the happiness, the active mind and the active body, the member of society, the nature, etc. And then it all needs to come together and all be one to improve not only the health of the individual, but any children that may be produced through that individual, but also the community, the generations um, afterwards are all we're not independent. So can I just sort of reiterate, we just need to create and encourage healthy, happy, equal, safe future generations to live in a healthy, happy, safe, sustainable environment. One of them is not enough. And I hope you know, through the questions, we can discuss it further. We can open up the conversation. As I said, you know, this is just, well, this is just in my mind, the sort of the, the, the embryo of harmony and health. And what the adult will be, I don't know, but we can feed the embryo and, 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 and work because I think this is going to be good for the individual, for the community and future generations. So I hope I'm not a dreamer. I hope I'm not the only one. I, I, I just hope you'll join me on the journey. So thank you very much for, for listening and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Michael. What a fascinating and rich presentation you've given us there. I was struck by your reference to the importance of silence and stillness in our busy lives. And having just received so much really interesting and thought provoking information, I wonder whether we should just take a moment to pause and just distill our thinking and to be still and then let's see what comes from that and what kind of questions people have to share. So we'll just pause for a moment, everyone, and then we'll go into the, the Q&A. So Michael, 
a first question for you, which came up very early on in your presentation. And it's probably got a manifold answer, but what does hum, a harmonic approach mean precisely? And just to, just to help you there, um, and let me just look a bit further up. Mariana kindly gave some references to this word harmony and what it means, joint, agreement, concord, wholeness, a being whole, something that is simultaneously whole and apart. And I remember a child in school saying that harmony was diversity in unity. So this harmonic approach, what do you think it means? I, thank, so, thank oh. I, think, I think you've answered it. And I think that that was my sort of my opening slide that I think people do differ in what they feel that harmony is. And equally, I think a lot of harmony is going on already and we're unaware of it. Um, but how I, I, I think it goes back to, to Mariana's comment, what harmony means, you know, it's, it's looking at yourself, then looking at your community, looking at the environment. You know, I say to patients, you know, the food that you eat is important, but the food that your food eat is even more important. So we've got to look at it sort of horizontally, sort of vertically, that it's you know, the food and then the plant and then the seasons and the environment and the toxins, etc. And then you've got horizontally as well, it's within the community and the different generations, etc. I think we've got to go back uh, to history and, and, and learn from the history. So you know, I've drawn sort of Venn diagrams about how, what I think about harmony. You know, it goes back from the history, but equally, we've got to accept like we are with the COVID vaccination, modern science, but like I said about the, the, the penicillin, be aware of it, that there may be, I'm not gonna say there is with the COVID vaccination, but there may be some of the modern medicine be harmed, like some of the old medicine can be harmed. But also I think is listening and changing your, having changing your views. You know, I always say my views are a lot of things. Let me finish before we think I'm more arrogant than I am, that my views are perfect because Cardinal John Newman, now Saint John Newman said, to change is good, to change often is perfect. So you've got to keep on changing your views as new information comes in. Thank you, and Faith has just added here. So harmony is a completely holistic approach looking at all aspects of a person's life. And I think that probably resonates very strongly with the message that you have shared today. I mean, and a further question on that is, why, why have we got it so wrong? I mean, we have a lot of practices in the world which are really not very healthy. Mm. And we still don't seem to have understood what all these manifestations of health that you have highlighted mean. And I'd love to know, and I, I, I'm not a guru in that, I don't know why we've got it so wrong, but I think, you know, whether it's commercialism, whether it's striving for more, I don't know, and, it, and, 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 and one could go back, is it religion or lack of religion? I don't know where it is, but it, I think the problem is, is my wife um, uh, uh, doesn't want it, but I want my, my gravestone, not like, um, uh, what's it, Spike Milligan who said, I told you I was ill, but I want my gravestone, just say the happy, simple doctor. I think we're sometimes making things very complicated. Mm. And, 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 and I think you know, we, we look for complicated solutions. And I think sometimes, like all I said to you, there's nothing complicated, there's nothing magical. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, it's just keeping things simple, I, I think is so important. So do you, do you mentioned at the beginning about other traditions and other parts of the world where you've learnt and understood a health perspective from. Can you explain that a little bit more? I mean, we've had reference in the chat today to the Ayurvedic tradition and Ayurveda. Are, are there particular things you've learned from some of the other traditions well, of the world? Again, again, I think, you know, again, when it's quite fascinating when you look about the history of you know, Ayurvedic medicine, Yunani medicine and traditional Chinese medicine, they all start in some different places. And, but they, they all have a very similar, similar sort of uh, concept and 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 the one thing I think again is it's it's using simple techniques 
that in an Ayurveda, and again, what we're doing with animals in Ayurveda is looking at body secretions in order to see what's going wrong, that understanding what's happening with the feces or the urine and looking at the eyes, etc. cetera. And, and, and it is a term, again, we use in, in the animal world, but we don't use in the human world is the term condition. If you and I are going to Royal Ascot, we see the horse going around and say that horse is in good condition. Um, and if the horse had had an injury or something, it would lose condition. Um, and I think with, with, Ar I've lost, with Ayurvedic medicine, they're looking at the person as a whole. And I think that's what perhaps we are become too specialized and not looking at the person as the whole. And again, talking about the um, uh, what I've learned, again, one could see the power of rest and healing. When, a, when in, in, in India, you see people after operations will be sitting there just resting and relaxing. Over here, we often have the television going and the internet going, etc. So I think it's keeping it simple and thinking about the traditions of when they didn't perhaps have all those invasive tests. And, and most, a lot of methods of uh, diagnosis medicine can be made by just looking at the patient. Richard, gone. I am here. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Yeah. Excuse me, yes, I, I seem to lose connection just there. But, but, but the, the, the other thing, which, which I think is well as interesting nowadays, when, when I, 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 I see a patient face to face, is not face to face, is mask to mask. And it's much harder to get the body language from the patient, much harder. So do you think the way we, you've talked a lot about children and, and obviously the whole conception period, do you think that children are learning in the right way to understand this huge concept and principle of health? Because coming from an education background, I, I am concerned that a lot of what we do is very disconnected, very separated and fragmented out. It doesn't have this sense of of wholeness, of, of holistic thinking and understanding that you are highlighting so much through your presentation. And it, with your, your uh, an education, I, I think it may not be the children that are the problem, it may be the parents of the children that are the problem. <laughs> and, 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 and I think you know, that, that, that perhaps you know, when we look at you know, drinking and smoking, et cetera, it's the younger generation that are stopping the older generations doing it. And, Perhaps you and I generation, when we we're at school together, we drank more than the present generation. But I know you, well, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, is, I think it is so important, as you say, and, and that's why I, you know, I don't want to patronise you, but I think the, 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 the harmony in education is so simple, but so clear that you see it in a holistic, and it's not just, and again, it's when you went offline, when I was talking about medicine, you know, we've compartmentalised medicine. And it's like we compartmentalize health and, and we and, and you know people the, 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 we label people with certain conditions and once you're labeled with a certain condition everything is blamed on that condition instead of saying no let's look outside the body let's treat the patient as a whole and i've often wanted to say that you know on my website i say you know i don't treat people with endometriosis i don't treat people with polycystic ovaries i treat you as an individual and that may need a different type of care to somebody else. It goes back to what I'm saying about that evidence-based medicine. So back into the education, and I think that's where you, know, you as an educationist have such an important role, but I hope we can all work together. And Harmony, in my mind, is all working together. You know, the educationist working with the doctors, the primary doctors working with the secondary doctors, all, and that's what I saw with the Olympic teams, that it wasn't, you know, we all work together, and that was the joy of it, to help that individual win gold. We've all got to work together. We mustn't be in our silos. So let's think uh, about food because it's a, a topic that's come up a number of times in the chat here and education again around food. I mean, I, I heard a funny story that um, I was looking at where schools could do more about what children eat in, at their lunch times and someone said that the head teacher of a school that she was working with would walk around the lunch hall with a bit, one of those big grab bags of, of crisps 
and it just felt like whilst we all might enjoy a packet of crisps from time to time it felt like completely the wrong message to be sharing to the children and of course we're constrained by the budgets within schools around procurement of food and yet in the school where I was head teacher we got to 90 percent organic food mm -hmm. and really by just being creative around the ingredients we used and the menu that we provided do you think that we need to be doing more in that respect you can you see ways in which we can change that it may relate to the world of hospitals too i think there's no doubt and and and, and, and you know that the food is the forgotten medicine food is the forgotten medicine and it's again getting enjoyment but it's also the accessibility of food and also we've got to be careful that i think we you know that it's not elitism when you talk about organic people instantly think that organic has to be expensive and we must stop that. It's, it doesn't have to be expensive. This is it not least. It often is expensive. <laughs> but it mustn't, it shouldn't, yeah, it did, but it doesn't. Uh, healthy food or healthy food does not have to be expensive food. And I think that is the, the problem. And, and, you know, work that I do in, 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 uh, up in Scotland where, you know, there isn't healthy food available. And therefore, and, and, and therefore it's not only educating the children, but it's educating the the, the, the supermarkets, educating the suppliers and making availability. And, and we've got to break down these inequalities. I hate the term inequality. We've got to create equalities rather than, and, and, and that's what we've got to look at. So yeah, I mean, but then it's not only is it food, it's exercise. We've got to look at exercise. And you know, I, I think I would go more about that at schools that after about the age of 14, girls, participation in exercise significantly decreases and and we've got to look at the benefits of exercise and 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 that's why you being a sports gynecologist i can see that and then stress management is not you know we all have stress it's how you manage it and whether that is mindfulness or just going for a walk or having silence so here's another question for you michael how can holistic practitioners such as myself and we have a number of them with us today, welcome, um, work with doctors like yourself to improve holistic practices. How can there be more of this um, coming together around sharing of knowledge and ways of working? Well, I, 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 we, we now to need to create, like we've got the harmony in education, perhaps we need to have a harmony in health, we need to- There create, is harmony in health, yes. Yeah, yeah you know, and, uh, we, and, 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 and and, and all work together in a form, and, 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 and I was equally thinking as well that, you know, there's always good books. I mentioned half a dozen books here. Perhaps we need to have a, you know, like we have book clubs, we should have a, a monthly book club about certain books to read, whether it's, you know, you know, the book on happiness or book on sleep, et cetera. And I think it's just getting this conversation going and, 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 and create uh, a movement to drive this forward and and you know it's fantastic to hear that because you know we've perhaps i might have enthused one person open the conversation get everybody talking getting everybody working together and then we've got to influence the influences that's the important thing we've got to influence the influences so as we draw this conversation to a close do you feel two two parts to this question do you feel that people generally now are healthier than they were when you went into the medical world or less so. And are you hopeful about where we're going next? And knowing you as a person, I'm sure you are, but what, what is it that's giving you the hope now? I think one, we're having the conversation. I think, you know, it's beginning to be on the media and, and, and I don't know if anybody saw Country File this weekend. It was a fantastic hour on, about, you know, the benefits of, of social prescribing and the using community. However, I still fear that um, the, 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 it hasn't quite got out to the influencers and perhaps with the College of Medicine, we can do that. I still fear that we are compartmentalizing medicine and not looking at the person as a whole. And I still fear that we are breaking primary and secondary care and we should be dealing with, with care um, and working together. And I think we're not perhaps working together for a variety of different reasons. 
um, um, as, as a team to help individuals and the communities win gold. So there is, are people healthier? Yeah, but then we've got the other problems. Yes, they may be healthier, but then we've got to look at, you know, we talked about children, but the big fear I have as I'm getting older is old age. And we haven't got that right. We haven't got that right. And that's what we've got to think about is, is you know, what, you know, where is the, are we going with old age and the management of us? Because that's going to be a problem with decreasing birth rate, increasing old age, decreasing number of people who are going to support us. That's going to be the problem. So there's a quote here from Barbara who says, there's a need for humility to know that others have useful knowledge. Even in alternative health centers, I've seen disharmony because each practitioner thinks they have all the answers. Work as a team. Yeah, and I can't take that. I think that's so, we've got to work and respect everybody's. You know, there's fantastic work going on all over the place. Listen to people and use it. And, and I say, you know, I'm a, you know, I've done my, Ayurvedic training, I've done my acupuncture training, my homeopathy training, but I'm not an ex, I'm a conductor of an orchestra. And we've got, in order to play a tune, you need to be all working together in harmony. Well, thank you, Michael. I'm referencing one final message here, which is about having the courage to stand up when things are not right. And you're absolutely right that we must work together in harmony and as a team, but also on the other side, when we see things that really are not working well, are not healthy, are not in harmony. And of course, we can see that in so many places that we have the courage to say, let's look at this again. Let's see how we can change it and improve it and make it better for, for the benefit of all. So thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I know <laughs> Michael was slightly nervous that because of my teacher background that I might be marking him on his presentation. I wasn't slightly though. I'm looking for the red pen coming out later on, Richard. <laughs> so I will be evaluating your yeah, uh, presentation when I get, today. When I get <laughs> I'll, detention. I'll <laughs> Certainly not a detention, but um, quite the opposite, of course. Uh, it's been a wonderful presentation and you've really given us so many interesting things to think about and to work on and to take forward. And I think the chat as well has added a lovely new dimension to that with all your perspectives. So thank you to everyone who has been here with us today. Michael, one final word for you. I mean, I mean on the bottom of my slides has been my email or through Bonnie or through you. I'd love to hear from more people because we've got to open up this conversation hear different views as that person said, there's no right or wrong view. We've just got to listen and, and see how we can drive this together. And I think these presentations and conversations do need to be continued that it may well be that we come back to this harmony in health idea and, and way of seeing and understanding things and, and really explore it further. I think you've given us so much to, to go away with and to think on and let's come back to it. So Michael, many, many thanks again on behalf of everyone here. I'm sure we want to give you a big round of applause and, and a massive thank you. And just to let everyone know that we have our next event on the 4th of February. We are delighted to welcome Paul Martin, who's from the Devon Wildlife Trust. And he's going to be talking about natural literacy. And I know he's done a lot of work on it and he's really keen to share it just as Michael was today. So that's the 4th of February, five to six, Paul Martin from the Devon Wildlife Trust. So it just remains for me as we hit six o'clock to say many, many thanks to all of you for sharing in this, this event today. And we hope you've enjoyed it. And a huge thank you to Michael for, for taking so much care and putting so much thought into that beautiful presentation and all the messages you have shared with us. So many thanks, Michael, and Thank you. goodbye, everyone.